I mean, I thought C9 would be harder than TSM, so I'm feeling pretty confident going into CSM. I, I'd say I align. Um, every, every time I'm the, the most scared I am, that's always against Cloud9. Hmm. Uh, because I, I know if they, they're really going to take, like, if they control the early game, like, they'll just take over the game and the game will be done. Um, but when I play TSM, I don't feel like they snowball as cleanly. I feel like there's a lot of errors they do in their gameplay, whereas, like, I feel like Cloud9 just, uh, kind of like when I watch, like, China play, just, like, once you have a lead, the game is over. Um, oh. Whereas against TSM, I feel like it's more, like, I wouldn't say like the NA style, but more like they like control majors, they like taking games slow and go to like late game, um, which means we have more opportunities to win. Hello and welcome to the LCS. Some choice words by a team of liquid mm. <laughs> Jensen and Santorin, but always so eloquently spoken. Yeah, I mean, they've been talking so much smack with these two teams in particular. You know, they don't even think that TSM is the biggest threat that they face in playoffs already, and they just 3-1 the people they thought was stronger. Yeah. yeah. And there's, I think it's like a team-wide, you know, trash talk assault. I think yes. the only one I haven't I seen it. anything from is Tactical. Maybe he said something on Twitter today. Uh, I want to hear the TSM clap back. Where's that? I mean, they they weren't in play. They got a buy. <laughs> I think the, the silence speaks for itself. Uh, the silence yeah, they, is definitely. They, they don't the even first, need to respond. They were the first team. It's like we're already here. Yeah, we were yeah. waiting for you. Sure. Yeah, TSM's just been getting in the moment this entire time because Team Liquid, they do have the opportunity to back up this Mac talk that we are witnessing oh so wonderfully as a grapple against TSM in the fight for one of NA's spots at Worlds Woo! and a shot at the LCS Championship. This is huge because these rosters were constructed to go to Worlds. Yep. The amount of money both teams pumped into these lineups, the fact that they got these players, uh, imported them, brought them to North America. The entire point is to then go on to Worlds. And so with one of these teams, they're going to be sorely disappointed at the end of today. Yeah, and they're going to get knocked into the lower bracket, go against IMT, and then the winner of C9EG. When we look at the lower bracket, it's pretty stacked. So there are multiple teams yeah. down there that one could say should be a Worlds contender. Uh, but at this point, only a few can make it. Yeah, that's the crazy thing about the way this bracket works with 100 Thieves already taking that spot. Everyone has their eyes on Team Liquid, TSM, C9. Which of those teams are going to be the ones that take those final spots? It's tough. Uh, I think this match is going to be really tough. I think it's going to go to five games. It's really going to depend on what TL shows up because the TL that we saw last week was definitely... Not what I expected in draft and also in execution. Mm -hmm. They were incredibly good, especially in those first two games. Yeah, I think they surprised everyone. We saw Jensen on the Lee Sin pick, and it was probably the best Lee Sin performance I've seen out of him in years. Uh, and I think if TL is able to bring the much more aggressive style than we associate with them, it's going to look a lot more like their last two best of fives against TSM where they did win. I mean, the thing that was working well for TL in that series was that no one expected that angle from them. Yep. TSM has had a week now to have watched that, broke it down, analyzed how they got those advantages in the mid lane and top side of the map, and prepare their counter. And I mean, of course, TL also can try and add a new wrinkle to it, but at least the fact that they're now playing a really aggressive play style isn't necessarily going to come out of left field for TSM, who mm -hmm. hopefully have had the opportunity to, you know, cook up their own special stuff. Yeah, yeah. I heard the talk that y'all had on the dive. That one series was enough for so much perception to be changed I around this yeah. TL yeah. team. <laughs> I mean, no shade to C9, but I was like, they didn't look that good. I was surprised everyone was off the TSM bandwagon. I am still firmly in, in that bandwagon. Yeah, and yeah, as we are I going through... <laughs> yeah, Champions Light, Emily, yeah, how much were you reverting your thoughts over here? So I was like, I, unlike Mark, who gives predictions differently every single piece of content, <laughs> <laughs> covers all his bases. I, I'm sticking, I said before that I, that I thought TSM was going to win the series. I'm still going 3-2 TSM. I think it's going to be close. I'm really curious to see how this draft goes in particular. Wow. Um, I think taking the Gangplank and the Camille off the table is really interesting. I'm wondering if TL will still continue with the Ziggs, and if so, what TSM have to answer that? Well, TSM have a really weird red side ban phase right yes. now. Where they have hard targeted TL specifically on red side. Usually red side is the general bans where you have to target the OPs like the Zins and stuff. Uh, but they said, screw that, we're gonna leave everything up and we're gonna ban your top side snowball potential and especially Alfari. Yeah, and I think it makes a lot of sense. When we think about TL, we think about top lane, right? It's all about Alfari and having Centaur and support him as much as possible. And because TL is on blue side, they don't have the option to counter pick top. So I think it makes sense if they 
immediately just go for the Gnar. It's a pick that he's comfortable with. It's a pick that he can split push and side lane on. Uh, but I do think this is already a draft from TSM that puts TL in a situation where they're saying, hey, look, we're going to require you to play through other lanes to win. Well, and um, you know, TSM being the higher seed had side selection. They chose red side for game yeah. one for this reason. And I think it's interesting because TSM, Huni, is no slouch in the top lane either. And so, yeah, you and know, you pinch so much already. Well, and also I think that when we're talking about, like we were talking to Abadaga yesterday on the desk in terms of what he thought, how he thought these two teams were gonna match up. And one of the things he mentioned was topside and how TL are gonna focus on it. Um, I think the cool thing about TSM is that Cooney is actually pretty good, especially now that his communication has improved with the team and transferring his topside pressure to map advantages for TSM. Yeah, many will remember even on the nerf to Nocturne was still making things happen for the rest of the team and pulling bands away. Making our way through champion select here though, Team Liquid also securing the Jin Zhao. This is one of the key parts from their previous series was the Trundle, Zin, and also how Thresh worked into that. Uh, and so mm -hmm. here they get the two parts that work really well together and it makes it a little awkward for the Trundle counter pick to then have to try to counter this in and work through a Thresh's zoning tools. Yeah, and I like this uh, this two picks from uh, from TL because it gives them so much control over the early game. You know, there's still a lot of mid lane picks that give you the magic damage you need, like the LeBlanc, like the Syndra, and we know that Jensen can play both of those. And when we think TL, we think early game. I mean, this is one of the top three early game teams in the league in terms of goal difference at 15. So it stands to reason that they want to focus on getting a lead as much as possible and focus on getting core out of lane. I think that that was one of the things that was most powerful about the game against C9. Core basically spent zero time in lane <laughs> with tactical. So right, he was in every lane but bot lane, and I want to see them continue to do that. Yeah, Thresh is such a powerful tool in this draft. The thing that's really interesting to me is that it's TSM that's going with the Ziggs, right? Zig is, is a massive power pick. I also think, interestingly enough, how we talked about last week when TL drafted it. We weren't sure how it was going to fit with the playstyle that we'd seen them go with, especially in the final two weeks. Uh, Lost has not played Ziggs, but I do think the way TSM plays yes. is the way that Ziggs plays. Yeah, yeah I think I think it works well with uh, trying to unlock Sword Art Tournament around the map, and especially yep. if you think that's how TL is going to approach it. Mm -hmm. That is the question for me, though, coming into the week was, is TL going to try and replicate their game plan against C9, or yeah. was that a perks targeted, he dies a lot in lane face, he led the league in deaths pre-15? Like, is that what you were aiming <laughs> yeah. for? Because POE is on the opposite end. POE he dies the least pre-15. Yeah. He'll he'll sack waves. He actually takes a lot of you know losing matchups. So statistically in lane, it doesn't look great. But that's Poe consciously taking tougher scaling matchups. And so I'm wondering, you know, when you look at Jensen and, and Poe, you're saying like two control mage players. And I wonder if you know TL are going to try and ram this aggressive melee style down Poe's throat, or is it going to be hey let's let's handshake on some of these LeBlancs and Rises and uh, Syndras and Oris and stuff. Yeah. And I think it's going to be more of a handshake. I think it's uh, actually pretty curious that TL chose to ban uh, Lucian, uh, given that Lucian is a pick that TUSM has just not looked good on. That said, when generally pe pe people pick Ziggs, you're anticipating that Ziggs unlocks them to be able to play an AD mid. Mm -hmm. um, but there's still some power picks available like the LeBlanc. I think LeBlanc would be good on either side. When we think about one of the most com uh, potent mid jungle duos, it is LeBlanc Lee Sin. LeBlanc or, uh, uh, I'm gonna interrupt just so I can get it in before the pick. I'm actually wondering if they're gonna go Lulu here. It's something that I think uh, any sort of thing that buffs the Xin Zhao is like insanely good. Um, I've seen it in LPL before and it would um, not match, it would match up with like, they don't want to take Lucian. LeBlanc is still up though, so that is probably a better pick. Yeah. But I, wa I was curious if we would see that because Lulu can actually, like Lulu Xin can take over an entire game. Yeah, and we do know that they play Lulu. They played Lulu with Alfari on Malphite before, but yep. I think in this game, they're looking for uh, LeBlanc. It gives them a lot of early game potential. It gives them the magic damage that they need. It gives them many options in terms of coming later into the game with side lane and 1-3-1. So I personally like the TL draft so far. I think uh, the Lulu would have made sense because TL has done it, but you and I were talking before, Emily, about how across the world, the Blanc that we yep. find was the most played mid laner right now, has a lot of good matchups. Um, Except in NA because of the Rise games yesterday. There, it's a little stacked <laughs> against it, but... But, uh, but yeah, that's not a knock against NA, it's just because that series went the way it did, Rise is powerful. Yeah, so TSM instead, they do go for the Azir, going for that uh, yep. control mage like we were expecting them to go for. Yeah, we often see a lot of individuals going towards comfort later, but we all know this Picking would be a very powerful pick. Too. That's, a, that's a choice. 
Yeah, uh, just a choice. <laughs> I mean, it used to be a really common yeah. matchup when yeah. the E from the Azir could knock yep. up and interrupt the, the dash in from the Blanc. It was a really, really skilly matchup. Uh, has but gotten now, a little worse over yeah. the years, I would say. <laughs> now it's a little different. Yeah, Kaizen, quick thoughts on which draft you're preferring here. Uh, I prefer the TL draft. I think it plays perfectly into their early game focus strategy. You have uh, the most powerful jungler in the game in Zinzao and LeBlanc in terms of mid jungle prio. I mean, it pretty much doesn't get better than that. And as I mentioned before, Core JJ on the Thresh, constantly having the ability to roam and unlock his lanes, I think will give them the lead that they need. Now, Team Liquid and TSM both very aware of the stakes that are on the line here today. A world's qualification will be going to one side or the other. Let's find out who gets the leg up. everybody it's here it's time for another episode of the lcs playoffs and we got tl versus tsm after yesterday's series i am expecting nothing but the very best here today i am hoping for a full five my name is captain flowers cast it beside me mr isaac azale cummings bentley himself the literal world champion my friends and you're already seeing some of the banter being thrown up on social media <laughs> preceding the series today i love it you gotta you gotta trash talk before the series not oh yeah not after the series that's weak so these teams getting it in there i love it and i'm excited to see tsm coming out here picking red side that is so atypical in na you know most of the teams do prioritize blue side and you know they didn't get a chance to talk about it but to me it's very clearly to set up for this top lane counter pick of the aurelia you know, it was going red side, looking for a soul lane counter pick. The Gnar was picked early. There were so many bans thrown towards top lane, but they do get the Aurelia here. They have Speak on the Lee Sin, so it's early power from the jungle. It is this aggressive matchup for Huni here, who wants to go right at Alfari, who I believe is the best laning player in the league period. Not for top lane, just all over. This guy has been dominating lanes, so it is a bit of TSM throwing down the gauntlet. And in a best of five, it That's really great. can change the context of the series and, and the kind of outlook of this series. If Huni wins this lane, if he can get this counter pick and slam Alfari, well, the games going forward are so much different. And if he loses this with the red side choice, with the counter pick, TSM are going to have to go back to the drawing board and try to find a different way to really go at Team Liquid. It's one of my favorite things that stands as a difference between best of one play and then series based play, particularly for the longer one, like a best of five, yep. is just how impactful the ability to answer the. Oh, wait, hold on. Talking about answers. We got a little bit of damage, baby. We got first blood from Core JJ two minutes into this game. <laughs> Uh, I mean, Sword Art and Lost are contesting way too much against Thresh Varus. They have an insane level one. It's Hail of Blades here as well on Tactical. And Sword Art was just taking so much damage there. If there's one weakness that people will point to for TSM, it has been the bot lane 2v2. Sword Art has been good at the roams, but Lost is not a strong laning player, and Sword Art and him have not been a strong duo in the 2v2. And this is just straight disrespect. You will not win this level one at all, especially with Halo Blades on the Varus. They just have to kind of accept the fact that the the wave is, is really out of their reach. TL is playing this so incredibly aggressive, trying to actually zone them off experience. And TSM trying to contest it. The Flay connects. The Ignite is there. Flash E auto comes through from Tactical. That is enough to get that tick of Ignite to actually grab the kill from Core JJ. And already they're off to the races. The only slight condolences there kind of for TSM is the fact that the first blood actually went to Core JJ, but still it's it's looking rough already on the bottom side. That's not a very good silver lining for the no. dark cloud that is dying level one there. Very unfortunate for the TSM bottom lane and very well played by Core and Tactical. Remember for all of our Spanish speaking viewers, check out FlyQuest's Spanish co-stream over at twitch.tv slash FlyQuest. Freak made the joke yesterday, hey, at least they made it to playoffs. I'm not going to be that mean to them because, <laughs> honestly, FlyQuest does a lot of good <laughs> stuff out there. I like their Spanish streams. I like their positivity on oh, Twitter. Okay. Now, let's see if Spika can make it happen here in the top side. Alfari will be forced to Ooh. flash away. 
This is actually so big because look where the wave is, right? This is this is a wave that is going to freeze against Elfari. So now Zin needs to come up here and he needs to TP back and they need to fix the wave. Because if you just try to walk back to the wave and you don't actually TP, you're going to lose so much experience, so much gold there on the top side. And without your flash, it's incredibly difficult to do that. So that is why Santorin is heading up here. They are going to cover the reset of the wave, try to force Huni back, try to force him to actually match with his teleport. I don't think TSM will fight this, especially not with CoreJJ here. And this is just good play to cover Alfari, who's in a pretty difficult situation. Yep, bringing up CoreJJ, looking to be the X Factor here. He's got to be careful. As though. Huni's trading pretty aggressively with Alfari, but the thing is, now he doesn't have that defensive cooldown. Also, no mana left here in the tank, but he does have enough HP. It's still early on enough in the game. He can fall back to safety. But if they actually delay his base, it's really bad. Sword Art and Speaker are here. So now he has to stay around, and TSM are going to have to try to defend the Crashing Wave with three members because they want Huni to be able to pick this up. It does mean that the experience is going to be shared, unfortunately, amongst those members, but Huni, at the very least, will be able to pick up the farm. He won't be able to stop the wave from crashing, and that's why he was trying to play it so aggressively. He was trying to put it into this awkward spot. Instead, Alfari, with the help of his team, proper coverage from Santorin and Core JJ, he gets the crash, so he'll just take another recall there, go back to base, refill his resources, he grabs a refillable potion, grabs boots. And now he doesn't and, uh, mind walking back, right? Now exactly. it's fine. Now it's there's not all that pressure just built up in the lane. Puni will now use his TP to get back into that lane, so he'll be first to the wave. He'll continue to have that priority. Remember, he does have a slight EXP lead here in the current state of things. And you can see Lost is just doing what he can, farming up here. One of the power points of Ziggs, the champion's got a lot of power points, but his autonomy and wave clearing is a big one. It absolutely is. The scary part is when the wave is pushing away from you because you're pretty susceptible to getting wrapped around on. You know, if the Thresh comes behind you, you are in trouble. Lost getting put low, but has farmed well despite, you know, his support going down. It wasn't a kill on the tactical, it was just the assist, and he'll be able to TP back to actually catch this wave. Uh, we'll see if he has Lost Chapter Gold. Doesn't look like it. So you'd always love to be able to hang around in lane longer to really get Lost Chapter. Once you have that mana, you can start to feel comfortable. Right. But you can see the respect that he's actually paying this. TPing back further because he knows if he TPs to that tower and he gets hooked on arrival, you'll just get straight up. Yeah, you're just dead, right? Then you just, you wasted a summoner spell to give them money. <laughs> Very unfortunate stuff. That's a terrible summoner yeah, spell. Yeah, we don't, we don't want to use that spell Gives your opponents 300 gold. <laughs> Pretty bad stuff right there. You can see here some cool stats on the side of the oh. screen, though. Power of Evil, 24 and 15 on Azir. Overall, I don't know what that percent is off the top of my head, but it's I know that Jensen percent. is 20 and 4, and that is also some other percent that's even bigger. It is. Yep. Yes. So True. <laughs> two very impressive numbers <laughs> here on our screen right now as TSM is moving topside looking for the dive, perhaps. Sword Art is just level 3 here on the Leona. Yeah. Doesn't look like we're going to go through with this. It, it looks like inaction, but it's because of proper response. So you have to give credit to TL. If Santorin is not there, Alfari just dies under the tower 1v3 with no flash available. But they have been covering him. It was a good early gank from Spika actually forced the flash, but since that flash has been forced, Core JJ as well as Santorin move up. They cover the crash, allow Alfari to reset. Then on the attempted redive here from TSM, Again, he is covered by his jungler, and this is both teams looking to play around what they know their opponents want to get done here. And Huni, you know, will move aggressively, hits the E, but it's not going to be enough to actually fully commit to the dive. He is level 6 to level 5 right now, yeah. and it is Mininar, so this is kind of a dangerous time for Alfari. But with the wave pushing towards him, and Spika going back to base, Alfari should be fine to just farm this up under his tower, hit level 6. Yeah, the EXP is a big thing I'm noticing right now in both top yep. and jungle because you can see it's actually Spika that hits level 6 before Alfari, the enemy solo laner, does. Mm -hmm. Santorin's still here at level 5. That smite fight over the blue buff did go the way of Spika, so grabbing a lot of extra gold EXP along with that buff. But not a whole lot of action to speak of here eight minutes into the game because of those proper responses from both teams. Draw your eyes to how defensive this build is from Power of Evil. It's all wow, about we... survival here. Uh, Verdant Barrier, I believe, plus the Merc Treads. So super defensive build here, lots of MR. The CC reduction as well, knowing the Roams could come through from Core JJ. And wanting to stay safe against Jensen. Very clearly with this build, your goal is not to fight. Your goal is to just fight the minions and absorb the pressure that's going to come in here from Jensen. Right. This speaks to wanting to scale. This speaks to wanting to be stable. Utilizing the Azir as well as the Ziggs for an enormous amount of wave clear. It's very rare that you would have two control mages like this on the same composition these days. 
So it's going to be largely about buying time with Power of Evil with Lost for Huni. And that puts a lot of pressure on Huni as this one kind of X factor who's supposed to create advantages, who's supposed to create pressure on the map, while everyone else just withstands the pressure that TL is going to be putting on. Well, hey, there is a lot of pressure up in this top lane on Alfari. He is down 30 farm in the current state of things. TSM with a four-man rotation up into the top side. His power of evil goes for the shuffle, but it's Core JJ with a flash to safety. Always good trade, though. Quick roam, force out the flash. Jensen moving over here. I don't know that they're going to fully commit to this. With Power of Evil showing mid lane, maybe they poke and prod forward, but it's going to be too little too late. So TSM should be able to back it up, and we'll have to see how much damage Tactical is getting done on that bottom side because he has been pushing in the 1v1. He's going to be trying to threaten this Zig. So he has the Vamp Scepter here early on. Will likely be working towards an Eclipse, I would assume, with that early Vamp Scepter. And trying to shrug off the poke here from Loss, attack his mana, try to force him to take damage on the tower or take bases at poor times. But yep. thus far, it's been a pretty even farm lane down there with both supports roaming around. And really, all the action has been focused on this top lane. And it's kind of similar to when TL played uh, Cloud9 as well. We had that one game where Core JJ had 0% duo procs. Yeah, that and one. it was almost none for Vulcan as well. This time, though, it's kind of the shoe is on the other foot. It feels like it's been mostly Sword Art dictating the pace and Core JJ being forced to actually match yep. to cover his top laner. Well, right now, we're still only at one kill, 10 and a half minutes into this game. In terms of objectives, TSM is going for the first one of those here as well. This is the Rift Herald first objective taken on the map, considering that Ocean Drake has been live this entire time. No team showing a lot of interest in it here. Instead, prioritizing early gold. Okay, Rift Herald picked up, eyeball secured. Core JJ throws out the hook, but it leads a little bit too far forward. Jensen jumps in for a little bit of damage. Chains on the power of evil, roots him up. The follow-up is not there. Core JJ with that death sentence on cooldown from where it missed earlier means power of evil walks away. Yeah, power of evil, super tanky build, doesn't panic flash. He didn't have the ulties, so just knew he could stay calm. Abilities were on cooldown. He was going to be able to survive and just walk it out. But yeah, I mean, the dragon has been ignored because it's been all about getting this Aurelia ahead and all about, for the TL side, minimizing loss on the top side. But now, oh, Core JJ's behind him. Okay, Death oh. Sentence misses. Core JJ thought he would backstep a little bit and Loss just kept running home. <laughs> That's one of those things, man. You gotta guess which way they are going to go. Loss makes the read, continues moving forward there, does stay alive, and it will be tactical push back to base here. Santorin is around to try to protect this. I don't know that they're really going to be able to get much of anything as Lost likely will have to back it up, but they're going to actually bring the Herald to this lane, try to pressure forward, try to get this relatively low, because you know Herald plus Ziggs can equal a oh, tower. Oh, it's so good. You get it low, you execute with the satchel. It's not going to be a W max second, it is just E, so you will have to get it quite low to be able to do it, but speak at the very least trying to help cover the Ziggs on the push here and we'll utilize this pressure to take a dragon. Yeah, it doesn't look like we're going to see a whole lot of a contest here. You even saw the exclamation mark ping come out from TL. They're saying, all right, don't worry about this. Nobody go risk anything. It's not really that much of a, of a big deal at this point in time. So TSM will grab themselves that objective. First Drake of the game, Ocean. Second one's going to be Infernal, so it will be either an Earth or a Cloud Rift here yeah. five minutes from now. Team Liquid, though, still having about just near 1,000 gold lead. You can see that Eclipse will be our first Mythic item completed in this game. That Varus for Tactical on his way to becoming that very powerful mid-game piece that a lot of teams want to fight around. Exactly. It'll be interesting to see how TL wants to utilize him and how they want to do lane assignments with Jensen. Because Jensen's going to have his Mythic completed massively earlier than Power of Evil, who has gone for the Tear, the Verdant Barrier, the Merc Treads, all these kind of pit stops, the Dark Seal, the Corrupting Potion, like so much towards laning and, and just kind of survival. Yeah. So you don't really want Jensen just stuck in this lane against this guy who's stacking MR. You want him out to a side lane trying to pressure. So I do think that soon enough they, they might move Varus towards mid lane, have him laning against the Azir, put the LeBlanc in the side lane against Ziggs, and really try to get some pressure going okay. as soon as that Mythic is complete for Jensen, you want him active on the map because the last thing you want with LeBlanc on your team is him AFK farming against an Azir. Yeah, especially an Azir that you just saw some of the damage potential back when we were we had the camera on mid lane and we saw the trade. <laughs> LeBlanc jumps in, spell, spell, combo, combo, and it takes off 20% of his health and he just walks away. <laughs> so 
LeBlanc players, that is not the gameplay fantasy of the champion when you lock that in and that's go into it? the game. Sure? That's, a, that's not what LeBlanc players are queuing up for. Gore Drinker done now here for Santorin. So a little bit of extra survivability and burst power in those team fights here for that powerful jungler. And honestly, the pace of this game is a bit surprising for me just because of what both of these jungle champions are. I would expect it to be bloodier after 14 minutes. And I think it's not, not because people aren't trying, but because both teams are responding properly to the attempts, right? We've seen multiple looks towards the top side where both teams have covered. We have seen proper roams from the supports, getting vision, sweeping out enemy vision. And it's very difficult to make these effective plays happen when the other team is always there to just stop you in your tracks. And we can see how defensively Alfari is having to not only play this, but build this. Yeah. <laughs> he, he got himself a phage, but it's the Bramble Vest and Tabby super early on. Lee Sin plus Aurelia, it's going to be effective against both, but it means his mythic is very delayed. Sword Art up here again. I think he will okay. be spotted by the, by the Pixel Brush, so Alfari is just moving back very likely. Uh, this yeah. ward in the river would have spotted him on that roam. So again, it's in action because of proper defensive play. TL has it warded out, has it covered, and they're looking for a counterplay on the bot side. Lost is looking pretty dead. Yeah, Lost already lost half his HP there to Tacticals combo, and it's enough for Santorin to finish the job. TL with a 2-0 lead, but it will be TSM taking first turret of the game. So not a bad trade. We'll see how much tower damage TL gets. They are going to be resetting here and trying to move up towards that top side, very likely. Huni getting so much gold. You can see Alfari, you know, above the supports, but that's about it. Whereas Huni that, that is, is the it. richest. That's all he's got. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, he's the richest in the game. Um, so, you know, that, that 1v1 is not going to look good. The game will not be about Alfari. And so there's going to be pressure elsewhere on the map to carry. Alfari is going to have to play this supportive role, going to have to look for playmaking in the 5v5. And your laning experience is, I'm trying not to die. Yeah. And this goes back to what you pointed out at the very beginning when we first loaded into the Rift. This is why TSM picked red. This is the counter pick in top lane to play around Huni and enable this champion and support him. So they're sticking to the game plan. They know what their guns are and they're ready to shoot them. We just got to see if they're firing blanks or not because <laughs> we've all seen Huni's highs. A nerf gunner or a bazooka. And What's we've all be? seen <laughs> Huni's lows. That's true. So they here's seem to be pretty separate. Playoff Huni is in effect, or at least all the TSM fans are hoping for that, because a lot has been put in his hands here in this early game. Down here in the bottom lane, they're looking to make the dive. Bit of damage coming through, but is it enough? Doesn't look like it. Jensen stays alive and he flashes back forward. He wants to make sure Power of Evil is dead. He will get his wish, but he'll die doing it. Yeah, they do get the kill. It is a trade, so Alfari getting a little bit of gold off that TP, nicely done by him. As this, again, as soon as Jensen completed that Mythic, as expected, he went out to the side, but to circumvent this LeBlanc versus Ziggs matchup, they've just moved Lost Mid to match Tactical. Sword oh, Art Gove. Sword Art just gets deleted. Santorin's got the power there to make the turret dive happen. Core JJ stepping back outside of the sweet spot on the ult. He lowers the damage enough Huni, to though. live. Huni's ready to go. He oh, has his boomer. flash. He could just flash the wall and go crazy if he wants. Let's see. No. No, not going to be able to make it happen. Nope, he he got there. slowed immediately on TP, and then that was actually, it looked like an invisible box. Yeah, it was the box. You can see it's on yeah. cooldown on the on the left. So stepping through the box, gets slowed by the boomerang, is on arrival, then has to walk through the box. If that boomerang was timed incorrectly, I do think we see an alt flash and likely a double kill because Santorin and Cordia Day both had no flash and were down about 20% HP. So important timing. Ooh. Spika, though, forcing the flash out here. Yeah, this is the second Herald of the game early, and that's likely going to be the tower dead with Ziggs here in position. No plates available. He's already prepping that W. Yep, with the satchel already in place. Boom! Even though Shelly can't kill it on her own, Ziggs and Shelly are just best friends here in the early game on Summoner's Rift. So Tactical cannot defend the Tier 1 turret there in mid. TSM with a 2-0 to turret lead. That's making up for a lot of the gold difference in the kill advantage that TL has found for themselves. So 4-1 to one there in kills, 0-2 to two in turrets means a game that's not even 600 gold apart. But TSM has now stacked their second Drake. Cloud Soul this time around, if they can get two more of those. Up here on the top side, Jensen will be crashing the wave into the turret as Power of Evil has Sword Art right behind him just in case a dive is coming. Now, while I don't think Cloud is what they were hoping for, Cloud Soul, when you are playing these heavily split push games, especially melee versus range, can be really nice for the chase down. If you do get Gnar in an extended lane as the Aurelia, you pop the ulti, you get that move speed. So yeah, that was just the boomerang slow, steps through the box, just showing that. So 
It wasn't a bug on the player side, it was just a spectator thing where I think with the toggled vision, we couldn't see that as he walked through. Uh, but either way, TSM keeping it very close as far as the gold lead goes. They do have just a 600, or I guess about 800 gold lead now for the XTX gold advantage on the TL side. But TSM have two dragons, so they'll be working towards that soul and trying to utilize that in the side lane for Huni, that additional move speed to really stick to this Gnar and not allow him to get away. Well, at least for Alfari, Divine Sunder is up and running. You already mentioned how the lane difficulties, coupled with the fact that that snowballs on itself and makes you have to build more defensively, meant that was going to be a way away. Well, hey, we're there now. At least he's got that up and running, right? A little bit of a power spike on that. But looking back over at TSM, we've also got both those Leandries running for the two mages that are available here. And there is so much AOE, so much wave clear between these two champs as the game scales forward. That's one thing that I always look at in any Ziggs game. The team that's up against the Ziggs, you better have damn good Baron use <laughs> because otherwise you're playing League of Legends against Ziggs trying to push. Well, and, and it's tough because it's not even just Ziggs. It's Ziggs and Azir and TSM have the side lane advantage here with Huni, mm -hmm. which is why it's somewhat interesting, I think, that Huni isn't actually building for that 1v1. You know, grabbing another Phage here is likely going to be Steric, so it's yep. more the team fight setup instead of something like the Blade of the Rune King. Uh, or even the wit's end, you know, it's more likely those on you just want to see like builds like the Bork dive onto the guy, kill one dude, specialize in the side lane yeah. role type of build. I okay. think if you're going to commit to the side lane, but this to me says that TSM says we're not going to be able to get enough of an advantage in side lane. It's about creating an advantage in side lane, then taking it to the 5v5. Okay, well, we got a crazy fight here with the bottom side. Alfari's going to get jumped on there as Hooney's going in, but now they're switching the attention over to Core JJ, and the man's already down. Santorin's in the middle of five, but he's got to get away somehow. Gets kicked back the other direction, and Jensen's made his way in of the fight. Help bars are dropping here on both sides. Oh, Hootie wants more. Hootie's going in, but he's slammed into the wall. Here's Alfari. Jensen keeps on looking, but now he's got to back on out. Spika and Lost continuing throwing out a couple of projectiles. Alfari's nearly dead, but nearly is not enough. TSM continue just trying to shove this wave out by themselves the time to get away. It'll be three kills for TL2 for TSM. Oh, that was such a close fight there. Hootie just barely not able to actually connect with the E, with the stun on Alfari at the very end of that. Alfari with the sidestep meant he went mega. He gets the Mega Nar out. The initial play here from Huni moving aggressively forward. The first pick comes on to Core JJ, who just gets locked down by a great ultimate there from Sword Art. They're able to burst him down while Spika is kiting back and the TPs do arrive. Santorin, no flash available. The scoop in here from Power of Evil is good, but Jensen got so much damage down with the double distortion forward, chains up and locks down the Azir for tactical, who's able to snipe him out. Then as Elfari comes in here, he sidesteps the stun from Huni. Able to get the Mega Nar off on Huni means Huni oh. goes down. You know, that would have been a kill on Elfari before he could Mega out instead, which could really change the fight. Maybe Huni's able to go forward and actually continue to get even more done there. But Elfari Holy. survives. Huni goes down. Tons of damage coming out from him, though, in that fight. And honestly, impressed by the amount that Santorin That's has done. That's what I was surprised by. 3,600 damage from the Xin Zhao in the middle Ooh. of everybody. Yes, you would expect the Irelia that's been given all this attention and all these resources to top damage charts. Otherwise, you've got a problem. Yeah. But looking at Xin Zhao, you're like, wait a second. This wasn't a bloody early game where he's got five kills out of nowhere. I mean, he this got is... zero ulted into the team and top yeah, the damage. He's just... Holy cow, that is the kind of performance Santorin needs to be putting on here for TL to get a dub in this game. One and a half thousand gold lead. Tactical's pushing things up here in mid. Team Liquid still without a single turret to their names. Trying to play this objective game a little bit. Jensen jumps in, lost in some trouble, but Jensen is too far forward, and TSM sits him down. Jensen seeing that juicy zigs. That was the kind of damage you're looking for as one of those LeBlanc players but didn't realize how many members were behind him. You know, you might expect one, you might expect two, but there was four members from TSM mid there covering their zigs. The CC chain comes through on a Jensen. He gets absolutely knocked off the map. And with him dead, this means a third straight dragon likely going over here to TSM. We'll see if they want to try to go for a flashed in lantern out or the steel play. They look like they're setting up for it, but is it worth the risk here? Okay, hook comes out. Nope, that ain't gonna happen. But at least it saves the flash. The yes. hook onto the enemy player allows audacious charge. Now we don't spend a five minute summoner spell. Yeah, that was, that was well played, I think, by both sides, honestly. You know, Speak is securing the smite. But as you say, it was not a costly attempt at the steal no, from at all. TL. 
So he goes over, he lanterns back. Both sides kind of play it right. And TSM, who had the man advantage, end up coming up on top as they should. But it does mean that they are now at soul point. You know, the Mountain Soul would have been better for them in this situation, trying to stay alive against some of these bursty champions. The Poe coming through from Jensen and Tactical. But you don't get to choose what you <laughs> get. And uh, they'll have to make do with this and try to see how much they can get done with that potential Cloud Soul in a side lane if they are able to get it. All right, so let me ask you this, Isaac. Let me put you on the spot here a little bit. Is this 200 IQ or is this just Mega Papega? You just give it over. You just let them have the Cloud Soul so now that there's Elder to fight for and you don't have to be stuck in that situation of low low reward, high risk. Just get rid of it. Bye-bye, Cloud Dragons. Elder Drake for the rest of the game. So I, I think I think the question becomes, do you think you can win the 5v5 for that Elder, right? Because if okay. you just give it over and, and you can't fight for the Elder either, <laughs> then it's definitely Mega Okay, then, then it feels So, bad. you know, then it's like, <laughs> you've got the Elder Dragon to fight for now. And they're like, yeah, we'll take this too. <laughs> so I, I think right, it really enough. kind of depends. On, you know, I think they're going to contest. Uh, whether or not they will try to trade something else for it. You know, to your point, hey, if, if you're not that worried about Cloud Soul, maybe try to trade it for Baron and try to set up those sorts of plays. But they've become very difficult as teams have gotten pretty adept at uh, defending that. Jensen flashes away, trying to survive the attempt on his life from TSM. Another distortion to gain some further distance. Speaker keeps on chasing Sonic Wave, Resonating Strike, no energy left. They brought in Hooney too, the entire cavalry has arrived, <laughs> and Jensen will finally die. They give the kill over to Power of Evil. Uh, the problem for TL is there was nothing on the map for them to really take, so they're pushing up mid lane. They will try to take this tower. I like this kind of line of defense they're setting up here with Santorin and Core JJ, trying to poke people out, keep them away. Ziggs will wave clear some, but at, at the very least. Health. That's that's one button. The dude pressed one it's button. A good button. It's about the quality of buttons, not the quantity of buttons, you know? As, as someone who plays Skarner, that's a Gucci I've never button right understood there. that. I press Q nine hundred <laughs> times per yeah, game. Yeah, but you're but and what does more? You're alti. Quality <laughs> button right there. All right, quality buttons versus quantity buttons. Well, hey, we've got some items stacking up here in this game. That tier of Power of Evil, almost full stacks. Muramana for tactical, mm -hmm. that one's fully stacked. That's fully evolved. That's always a huge power spike, pretty much whenever you see a champion having that item completed. Sterix Gage, the top part of both teams. Four out of ten champions have Sterix Gage ready to go. So survivability in the team fights is now through the roof. Yes, the ability sir. to bait, the ability to outplay and know your limits for all four of these guys is going to be very big here. I think one of the scary things here for TL is that Power of Evil, he went this early defensive build. He's now kind of past that power trough because he's on two completed items and they are not defensive ones. No. He has the Void Staff. He has the Leandries. His tier is almost fully stacked, so likely he's going to be building that up next. Huni also went for this more kind of tanky build, but he's going to be moving towards the Wit's End as his next item as well. So moving into more of these luxury items, trying to really kind of shore up their offense as the defense is really good to go for everyone except Ziggs. And it's going to be about keeping Loss safe and, and him positioning well because he is so squishy. He is so clearly the target for TL. Oh, yeah. That if, if you're cut out, you can instantly die to LeBlanc. You could get poked out and burst out by Tactical. Even Santorin can knock you down. Everyone else is pretty tough to knock down right now on TSM. So also, third item, non-boots item, I guess I'll ex... ex uh, whatever, that's what I was saying. Anyway, let's tell, hold we on, we got, another, we got ourselves here. another fight here. Tactical takes a whole lot of damage there from the bomb, but they're able to disengage. What I was going for, Serpent's Fang in Tactical's inventory. Yep. He's recognizing the Sterics. He's recognizing the Lock of the Iron Solari. Now, remember that the item does only have 35% of its, 35% uh, of shields being reduced instead of mm -hmm. 50 because he is a ranged champion, but that can still go quite a long way when you're dealing with a shield that procs for a thousand. Absolutely. And I mean, Safeguard's going to be spammed out between these fights as well. You know, Lee Sin shield's going up there. It is high value, and it's a it's a decently efficient item even without the shield reduction. So, you know, grabbing lethality there makes sense here. I think in this situation, multiple members here from TSM coming mid. They're looking for a play. Okay, speaker with a kick. They're going after tactical, but they can't quite get him. Sword Art now stuck in the middle of three with the rest of TSM unable to jump into the fight. They don't want to put anybody at risk. So instead, Sword Art will be the sacrifice. Jensen picks up the kill, and it's eight seconds until the Drake. That was a critical pick before the soul. And a costly mistake from Power of Evil. I think he flashed into the wall there and ulted. He was trying to get over the wall to actually scoop in tactical. Oh, no. And with his flash on cooldown, with his ult where it was, that looks like a fail play from him, which means 
instead of them getting a pick and getting their soul, they are delayed on it. We'll have to watch him okay. one more time. So he's up on this top side right around here. Power of Evil, I do believe, is trying to flash over the wall and follow this up. He's not against the wall right now, though, yet. Oh, yes! you got to no! be hugging that wall to make that flash happen. And a critical misstep there from Power of Evil. He's so good in these late game positionings, in the 5v5s. He has a costly misstep there, though was not positioned against the wall when he went for the flash. Ends up meaning Tactical gets away, they lose Sword Art, TL delays the soul here, and now they're up gold, the soul has been pushed back, and they're getting themselves into a better and better position in this game. Yeah, that, oh, those are the ones that haunt you at night. It's it's one of the universal rules, I think, just in uh, like the typical League of Legends experience for anybody, not just pro. When you're having a very close game, it doesn't matter if you've been the guy who's been doing everything right so far, or you've had the most pop-off plays, or you've got all the kills, because one mistake can weigh more than 10 good plays if it's at the wrong time. Exactly. I mean, they're all not built equally, right? You know, we, we kind of joked about quality buttons, quantity buttons. I mean, it's, it's, it's a similar thing here with the plays, right? If you make an error around the Baron, if you give over something like a Baron, even if you have made a bunch of small incremental advantages happen, you can give away can more with that one big mistake. We've all felt that playing league. You, know, you get the Baron stolen from you, you throw with a lead, and those plays hurt. And they have got to collect themselves mentally, prepare for the next dragon here, and tighten yeah. it up a bit because TSM want to grab that soul. They've been working towards it for 30 minutes, and they've got to grab the reward. Now, the nice part is, it's not like, you know, they lost an inhibitor, their no. base got cracked open, Baron was just completely given over to Team Liquid for free. It's not that egregious of a mistake, but it is some things that they should have had that now we're still waiting for. Oh. Three minutes from now will be when that Drake spawns. TSM again looking to make some sort of play here in the top side jungle. Power of Evil will be the one shoving out the wave, while Spika and Sword Art are both here in the shadows making sure that this is done properly. Jensen will just back on up. Doesn't want to lose his Banshee's Veil unless he absolutely has to, so keeping a good amount of distance from those soldiers. Core JJ is here. Jensen jumps in for a little bit of damage onto PoE. Takes about half his health. Santorin and Tactical also coming in here on the flank. Santorin just trying to make sure he's staying in range there with the Sweeper for Tactical to clear out the wards. And now that the Team Liquid Cavalry has arrived, TSM does need to be a bit more careful. Absolutely. They've got to back it up here. Santorin will be spotted. They've got to continue running, though. Power of Evil. Getting poked down to about half. So if he gets caught at this point, it's going to be rough. And I mean, TL are oh, on dangerous. the chase. Alfari is here as well. They're looking. so far out on the map. I mean, Huni can teleport to this. Let's see if they end up trying to defend. Okay, Power of Evil with the turret. So at now least they, they got to something to hide underneath. Lost is waddling up here. Huni's still in the bottom lane. Alfari going forward. Sword Art might be going down. A lot of damage down under the TSM support, but they won't be able to kill him. Meanwhile, Huni's grabbing a tier two in the bottom lane. It's working out well for TSM. So that engage looks really funny, but it's actually really smart from Sword Art. He is going in to create space here so his teammates can walk out above safely. If he does not go forward there, they engage onto Power of Evil, who is in more danger. Not only does it buy time for his teammates to walk out, it buys time for Hootie to take the tier two on that bot side. So yes, it costs Sword Art his flash, his ulti. He puts himself in a dangerous spot, but it is to the benefit of his team. And that's that is support. Smart support play. That's support play right there. Being able to recognize what is the greater good of the team and play around it properly. Good stuff for Sword Art. TSM still keeping this game pretty close. 2,000 is the amount of gold that Team Liquid has had ahead of them. And it's been that way for quite a while. So it's not oh. like that's ballooning super hot. <laughs> uh, some big buys just happened. Death Cap, Death Cap. Both just purchased. That was a full Death Cap that and they just, just bought. And now you're in a world where you've got to try to somehow continue pushing against Ziggs or Azir, or, oh, hold on, maybe we should try the Baron. Oh, wait, we can't, because it's Ziggs and Azir, <laughs> they both have a death cap. That's scary, The choices man. are being choked, Mr. Azale. And, and even if you get the Baron, the wave clear is so powerful. You know, when you do have these AP carries, these control mages, they can clear out Baron minions. So we'll see what TL wants to get done here. Huni has been bought so much time for his team. He was given resources early. Really, they have not gotten paid back for that yet. He is still in a pretty strong spot. Completes the wits end, is going towards the GA next. We'll see where TSM wants to fight. I think it's just going to have to be this 5v5. We'll okay. see if they want to try to go for the soul or if they're just going to give this up and try to take the tier two top. Yeah, the tier two top is rather low already. Huni's up there keeping that one pushed. Now down here, 
We got Team Liquid with the four-man squad. Jensen is up a little bit higher. Ooh. He's ready to flank if needed. Lost is teleported down to join the other members of TSM. Huni doing the push there in top side. Takes the tier two and he backs away. Not pushing any further just yet. Team Liquid are on to the Drake. They're making the catch. They've already got Lost. He's out of the picture. And how far he's going in for more. Sword Art's going to be your next target. Huni decides to teleport in and join the fight. It'll be a 4v5 here in the bottom lane as TSM are running towards the Team Liquid base. Can they reach a turret ruin? I don't even believe Power of Evil has the cooldown on his turret ready to summon. Santorin's going in. He goes for the Crescent Sweep and Huni fires off the ult and he doesn't hit a damn thing. Huni sends it into Timbuktu and TSM will not have a prayer. Huni finds nothing and they're all eviscerated except for Speaker. Team Liquid marches to Baron. Team Liquid have withstood the storm. They get the kills. They're gonna take the Baron all off this pick. Lost separated himself from the rest of the team there. It was a four-man squad from TSM, but he face checks the brush towards the dragon when they're not even gonna contest the dragon there. Lost gives over a freebie and everyone on TSM pays the price for it. It's now up to Spika trying to see if he can get a Miracle Steal here, but this is going down so fast. All right, Spika, it's unlikely. Okay, it's impossible. Afari's completely running interference here, does not want to allow him into the picture. The chain CC coming down, they will remove him from the equation. Baron is smote, and Team Liquid 13 to five, 5,000 FTX gold advantage now. This is a team that is set to break some bones in the TSM base. Yeah, they're looking like they're in such a great spot. And this, it's all about Lost here. You just got to keep your eyes on Lost, where he is going. The rest of the team is heading down here. He's heading up here by himself. Gets absolutely destroyed by Jensen and Core JJ. We talked about it earlier. You are the guy who is not building any defensives. You are the guy without the self-peel. You You're have the glass got cannon. to be exactly. You have got to be behind the squad. When he goes down, Huni decides he's got a TP here because he's trying to defend the rest of the team. Yes, Huni does miss on the alt in this position. But let's be honest, it's so difficult to actually fight your way out of this 4v5. Jensen on the sidestep from the ulti there. Huni not able to connect. And without him going nuts in the fight, there's yep. really not much going on. The hook lands on Power of Evil. He's gone. It's not even close. Huni almost takes down Alfari, but they were going to get all wiped regardless. And TSM have just made some critical mistakes at important times. The fail flash from Power of Evil over by that initial take from the soul. They fail there. Then Lost gets picked off in the bot lane here, delaying the soul, giving over the Baron, and TL have created their first significant advantage of the game. They're up 6K now. They're in the driver's seat. Let's see if they can hammer it home because TSM does have incredible wave clear, so they can hang on and delay. We've got a minute and a half left on Baron. So let's see if Team Liquid can reach that base. They can breach those walls. Now, right now, Spika wants to hang out, see if maybe there's a kick to be made, right? Just one pick during a Baron push can stall for so long. It's not like your opponents can just brute force things in a 4v5, but Team Liquid will not give them the opportunity to do that. Tactical also doing a good job. He's hiding in the brush, firing off the arrows whenever he can, does not want to present himself as a viable target because he knows, similar to Lost, he's going to be the one they're looking for. Speaker getting caught out a bit here by Santorin, just getting his butt whooped, not even close in that fight, as now Sword Art will be forced to flash away to try to stay alive. Team Liquid doesn't want to overcommit for that when they almost kill him off with a piercing arrow, and Jensen goes on a rampage. 4v5 for the next 40 seconds. Jensen gets the earlier pick on Lutz, gets another pick here on Sword Art, and now down a member, pushing in waves across the map here, TL. Ooh. Even getting the flash off Lost. They are closing the trap here on TSM. They're pushing in on all sides. They're going to knock down at least one inhibitor here, if not two. It's looking pretty dire for TSM 38 minutes into this game. Inhibitor number one is down. Inhibitor number two still has its turret standing, but not by much. With Baron about to expire, Team Liquid's recognizing, hey, the push is pretty much over. That's Ziggs and Azir without Baron now. Let's go back and spend the money. And I've got to say, this is honestly classic TL. At their best, they are often a team that withstands the onslaught, that depends upon playing more clean League of Legends, punishing opponents' mistakes. They are willing to play the game slowly because they have such confidence in their setup, such confidence in their ability to execute in these difficult situations. 
They gave up the early dragons, but they have been steadfast. They never gave up the soul. They have been the ones to find the picks, to make the plays when it mattered in the later stages. And now as a result, they have taken full control of this game, nearly 9K ahead. They are cruising and we'll have to see if they can close it out. And you saw it right there, how easy it is to not even need to get a kill. Jensen's just jumping in like this. Anybody that he finds, mm -hmm. boom, pop, pow. Comic book noises <laughs> everywhere. And he's getting two thirds, three quarters of your health bar. Doesn't matter if you're not dead, you're going back to base and Team Liquid get to do whatever they want. Absolutely. And, and you wouldn't know how much pressure Alfari was under at the beginning of this game if you checked in now. Yeah, 108, he never died. He's got just <laughs> as many items as Huni does at this point. And yeah. he was under constant pressure, but Teal did such a good job defending all of these plays. Core JJ, Santor, and Jensen moving around the map, defending their teammates, playing to cover their opponent's win conditions. And as a result, TSM could never really close the door on TL. And TL with three of these Cloud Drakes, I mean, Cloud Drake gets memed a lot, but when you have three of those stacking up ultimate CDR, that actually gives you a ton of extra power to go fishing with some of these abilities like the Varus ulti. He's gone. We've already got a GA out of the picture. Okay, Death Sentence comes out just a little bit late. Oh. Power of Evil. Woo! Nearly sent straight down six feet deep. He survives with 100 HP. He's walking back to base. He's got a heal. Team Liquid continue the push now. No Baron on the map for one minute. So it's not like there's anything else to be interested in. They are just going for this push. That mid lane wave is about to collide. Tactical firing off the arrow. Won't quite hit the mark on it. Man, I mean, Jensen is becoming such a terror now. He has so much CDR with his build, and then Triple Cloud, it's an 18-second cooldown on the LeBlanc ulti. Every time that is up, he can jump forward with a W, Q, R, Q. That alone, at this point, with how much AP he has, is threatening the squish. He's threatening to blow them up. He's got the death cap done. He's got 11 stacks on the Mage Eyes, and Jensen has been having such a good game here. Yeah, the SM have been items. hunting him, but they can't take him down. It's six item LeBlanc with maximum ulti CDR just constantly <laughs> popping you over and over and over again. It creates this just war of attrition where, okay, once we're on the front lines, we've probably got about 20 seconds before someone's nearly dead. So we got to make those 20 seconds count. Yeah. And it's so difficult to do. And, you know, on the TSM side, you know, they're not out of it just yet. It is Baron respawning. They only lost the one and hit off the last play. So we'll see, can they find the X factors here? That's what you're looking for. Power of Evil in trouble. Oh, Power oh. of Evil nearly dying there. Staying alive just barely yet again. And Sword Art with no flash this time has no way out. 4v5 again. Sword Art has died seven times this game. All of Team Liquid put together has not died as much as Sword Art has. He has been the one trying to be the sacrifice, trying to make sure that nobody else on the team has to be the one who gets killed. But time and time again, TL's finding something, and it's always him. Jensen's unstoppable. Lost has not been where he needs to be in the second half of this game, and Jensen's just making money hand over fist because of it. Double kill for the Team Liquid mid laner. The Baron is easy. The team fights are free. Come on down. It is a Team Liquid party. <sighs> Jets is just styling on him at this point. And they're making look, TSM look silly with these face checks because they absolutely dominated the vision around the Baron. TSM had no vision in that area. They knew that TL could be on it. They knew if they lost the Baron again, the game is likely over with the base already cracked here. They face check, they try to prevent the Baron from going down, but TL punishes, they turn, they kill them off. They don't risk the 50-50. And now TSM in such a difficult position, they're going in. Sword Art with a flash engage, but he's just gonna die instead. Huni tries to fight here on the front line, diving into the back, but his Guardian Angel is immediately popped. Now we'll come back to life in just a moment. However, that life quickly returns to yet another death. Tactical picking up the kill. There are only two alive right now on the side of TSM. It is the wave clear mages. Do they have what it takes? It doesn't quite look like it. Speaker rejoining now. It'll still be another 25 seconds until Sword Art is back on the map. Two different lanes now. Have those inhibitors destroyed. Team Liquid marching in. 
First Nexus turret already gone. Second Nexus turret. Nope, they're going after Spica and lost. Santorin needs a little bit more damage, but will not find it. It doesn't even matter. The Nexus is exposed. Spica gets hooked in. Jensen goes legendary. Team Liquid. Oh, they'll finally lose him there at the very end, but it's still 20 to 6. They dismantle TSM. Such a well-played game here from Team Liquid. TSM creating big advantages on the top side in the early game, committing so many resources up there. But Alfari playing weak side very well, having his teammates cover him when he was at risk, never going down until the game literally ended. Yeah! They, TSM just couldn't create the advantages they needed to justify picking red side with side selection to justify the Aurelia counter pick. They couldn't get the solo kills. They couldn't take down the towers and really close this game out. And I think it's going to be a tough call now. Do you repeat the same strategy or do you go back to the drawing board? Because while it's easy to say this didn't work, you also got to be honest and look at a couple key mistakes for TSM that really cost them. Yeah. You know, their first attempt at soul, the fail flash from Power of Evil, them losing that off of that. And then as well, loss getting picked down on the bottom side, resulting in an ace, resulting in Baron. Yeah. So it's like, what's that your takeaway? Even more. Exactly. It, it's so tough because what is your takeaway from this game? Is it the strategy works, but we failed and risk losing a second game with the same strategy? Or is it abandoned ship on the strategy with the potential that you had it right, you just didn't execute? And these are the fun questions that we get to answer because we are in the middle of a best of five and we are just getting going. Time for us to step away. But as we go, earlier this week, we had a chance to check in with our final Summer MasterCard Player of the Week speaker and grab his thoughts on the road ahead for TSM. Check it out. It is about time we honor our LCS Week 9 recipient of the MasterCard Player of the Week. This time around, it is TSM's very own Spica. Now, since this is coming at the end of the regular season and it is such an honor, I want to get your reflection upon your performance throughout the split, especially with your name being so prevalent in the Honda MVP discussion. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think this split, I've been playing a lot better than last split. Um... I think another reason is that, you know, our team cohesion has gone up a lot. You know, last split, we were a really, really new team. So I think it is difficult for a jungler to, like, look good when you're still figuring out how to play the game as a team, right? So I think as uh, we play a lot more together, um, just the team just looks better together. We're working together a lot more, and I am able to uh, just look a lot better than last split. And it's very important to have that idea of who you are as a team going into playoffs. This award is coming off of a 2-1 week, but that one was mm -hmm. from a more a <laughs> fun side game against Dignitas. What yeah. was it like ending the season on such a oh. note with some very strong performances, but some uh, shenanigans thrown in there as well? Well, I mean, I definitely hope to win that last game. Uh, you know, it's my first top lane game in competitive, so I was really hoping to win that one, but who knew? You know, had a different, different plan in mind. Yep, going into the series as the number one seed from the regular season, what do you see as the value of having this extra time to prepare because you get to go into that next level of the bracket versus being a team that has to play through even more of these best of series? Well, I mean, personally, I feel like I don't really feel a difference of getting the bye, right? Like um, last year, we play a playoff series every single week. I think Ashley. I prefer just playing every week because I feel like, you know, getting the playoffs experience is really important um, for some players, just getting into the, the mode, right? Like, uh, you, you know, this is playoffs, it's do or die. Yeah, what did you make of TL's performance against C9, considering that they really altered the look that they had on the team? Yeah, I mean, I think TL definitely surprised a lot of people um, last week, and they were playing a lot better than um, they were before. Um, you know, Centaur is coming back. I believe they've had a lot more practice than before, so it's going to be very interesting going up against them. But I th also think that C9 is not a very strong team right now. So, you know, their performance might be a bit inflated. Um, they look so good because enemy wasn't that good, right? So I, I think we're going to be having a lot of a better showing this C9 has shown, and I think we're definitely a way stronger team as well. All of that being said, it was also a surprise to hear from Jensen that was later confirmed by Santorin as well, that they believed going into that matchup that C9 were going to be a tougher opponent compared to TSM. Do you have any response mm -hmm. to that? Well, I mean, Jensen, you know, he always trash talks after the game, so uh, I'll show him what's up.
All right. I know we're all looking forward to the showdown between you teams that it is going on. So, Spika, thank you so much for stopping by. And congratulations again on this honor for MasterCard Player of the Week. Thank you very much. It's never been easier to stay in touch. So we never miss the chance to show how much we care. And thanks to all of you who used your MasterCard to order online or tap in store at restaurants and grocery stores, MasterCard is donating $5 million to Stand Up to Cancer. Together is how we help start something priceless. You know what's funny? What? Money. <laughs> <laughs> We are here at the State Farm Analyst Desk following the first game here on this Sunday between Team Liquid and TSM. A bit of a different pace from yesterday's matchup, but in the end it went You're over to TLC. Yeah, you know, <laughs> uh, different vibes for different days. But we did want to go ahead and kick it off with the draft here because some interesting choices made on both sides, some comfort picks as well, of course. Yeah, and I think the vibe and the pace were the, exactly what TSM wanted. Right? You want a situation where you have the late gaming option in Azir, you have the late game option in Aurelia, you also have Alfari in a situation where he does not get the ability to counterpick and just decide what's going to happen in the side lane. So I thought the TSM draft was fine, and I thought the way that they played it early game was fine as well. Whereas on the TL side, I, what I liked about this, and I said this going in, into the game, is it gave them a lot of aggressive options. Unfortunately, they ended up on the back foot, so they are actually playing defensively all game. So let's take a look at that top side, right? Because when we look at why TSM are here on red and what they drafted, they obviously prioritized the really counter pick into the NAR. And we were talking about how like a lot of this is going to come to top side, right? So as you can see, 
Um, you know, Svika started bot, he passed up, he got that level three gank, he burned the flash. There was a lot of attention paid to the top side. And then, so on top of these stats that we have with all the jungle help that Huni um, was able to get in this matchup, the CS difference he had in the forward percentage, you then have the support duo procs because once again, uh, you have Core roaming up there really quickly because he has to, you know, respond to the fact that, and, and Sword are also roam topside, um, that they're going to be focusing topside so heavily. Um, and that was very obviously the, the tactic for them. Uh, and it unfortunately did not pan out. Yeah, and we should remember, they also like basically triple banned Alfari. They banned the GP, they banned the Camille, they banned the TF so that they could not help Alfari top. And they put him behind, as much as I've seen him behind in a long time, and it still didn't work, right? So I think this is really concerning for TSM because when you think TSM, you think, okay, we neutralize laning phase so we can get to a late game scenario where we're comfortable and then reactively team fight back into the game. And that's not what happened. That was actually TL's playbook. Yeah, it's some clear playbook for that top side play from both of these teams, but I do want to make sure we get a look at one of the most pivotal moments in the game, and let's go ahead and see what Mark Z has to say about it for State Farm Neighborhood Tactics. That's right, another installment of State Farm Neighborhood Tactics, and in this one, I want to talk about the uh, game-winning play for Team Liquid, and especially how they were able to set it up. Specifically, kind of you heard Kaizen talking about the mid to late game decision-making, in the lane setups. And so there was initially a, a chase down in the top side sequence that you saw because it was Azir and you also had the LeBlanc. And so here, going into the dragon situation, as we roll the clip, you'll see that the Azir is going down the bot side. And even though the NAR Aurelia went really in favor of the Aurelia and the CSD, as you saw, the uh, Azir never really feels comfortable going into the LeBlanc. And so there's a lot of resources committing into trying to protect PoE. Like I said, in the previous chase down sequence that happened in the top side, it was another similar situation where the support and jungle are actually working with PoE instead of working in mid lane, which is how you see most 1-3-1 setups. Realistically, TSM's comp wants to be a 4-1 pushing in through the mid lane with the Ziggs and Azir. Neither want to be matching LeBlanc in the side lane. So you end up in this sick sequence where the Ziggs is actually TPing from mid lane, as you can see, down to join up with TSM. And it makes it a really awkward fourth uh, dragon setup. And so as we roll the clip forward, they have totally seated uh, river control. This gives TL the inside track to just start up the dragon while TSM's kind of trying to get bot lane wave push, which is not at all the setup that you want to see. Ziggs tunnels during this point, lost his thing, okay, I gotta try and steal the dragon, loses track of the TL members, gets picked off, and now because you're in this weird bot lane situation, you're on the wrong side of the map, you're cut off, and an entire chase down sequence follows. They get four for Ode, they lose the, the fight, they lose the Baron, they lose the game off the back end of that. And so this is one of the areas TL or TSM will have to clean up heading into game uh, two against Team Liquid. And to see how they're gonna do that, let's go jump back over to the desk. Well, I'm glad you pointed that out, Mark. Uh, I think Santorin said about facing TSM that they give them a lot more openings because their games end up being longer, because they end up being slower and, and drawn out. Um, I think there are a few key like individual misplays and this goes TSM's way. So I'm actually really curious to see how the draft goes in the next game, if they're going to continue to target Topside and Alfari, um, because it, this isn't a definitive don't, don't do that, in my opinion. Yeah. And with that knowledge, though, we also know that TSM are electing to stay on red side here. Where do you want to see the changes, Kaizen? I like that they picked red side. I think it gives them the ability to shut down Alfari. And I think that the way they play the early game with constantly camping the NAR and exposing, exploiting the fact that when he's in mini NAR, he's super vulnerable and he has to call for his support in jungle up. I think that was the exact thing they need to do. I actually loved everything TSM did until that dragon fight we saw. So I think draft the same, play the same early game, but later Later in the game, understand what your lane priority should be and don't contest things that you don't need to be contesting. Yep. An in-game focus here from Kaizen. Soon enough, we'll be getting into that second game. Team Liquid, they do end up backing up all that big talk with this strong performance here in game number one. And we'll see if they can continue that clapping or if TSM are going to bring it on back right after this. Not gonna lie, Jake from State Farm. That Daniel deal got me some sweet savings on my insurance. Daniel, State Farm offers surprisingly great rates to everyone. Sure you do. Tell you what, I'm not supposed to do this, but I'll let you try the chunk, honey. Oh, I'm good. Here's the deal. Great rates, kinda our thing. You wanna meet the queen? Uh, I'm not dressed for that. When you want the real deal, like a good neighbor, 
State Farm is there.